It's not uncommon to hear stories about employees who are bullied by their leaders. Now, these leaders are often characterized by an aggressive, emotionally impulsive, or intimidating management style. They create a toxic work environment that undermines employee morale and hampers productivity, teamwork, and ultimately accountability. Using emotion instead of reason, they resort to tactics like public humiliation, undue criticism, and excessive control. Now, here's an example. A client who is a diligent but relatively new team member accidentally presented outdated information in her report. Upon noticing the mistake, her boss's demeanor abruptly changed. He raised his voice, berating our client for her oversight in front of her colleagues. His outburst, filled with harsh words and pointed fingers, escalated quickly as he questioned her competence and attention to detail. His behavior had the effect of embarrassing our client and shutting the entire team down. We can easily see how bullying like this stifles innovation and open communication and poses a significant challenge to the overall health and success of the organization. Does this sound familiar? Well, stay tuned as we show you just how often this happens. Welcome to Dismantling Dysfunction, a podcast series for anyone who is ready to eliminate the dysfunction they experience in their organizations, leaders, or relationships. Each week, we explore common dysfunctions in organizations, delving into the systemic causes behind them, and giving you the exact tools and practical tips you need to dismantle them. Now, here are your hosts, organizational development and behavioral change experts, Dr. Ann Dranitzaris and Heather Dranitzaris Hilliard. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode as we are continuing our series on accountability and tackling this widespread issue of its dysfunction within organizations. Now, in our previous episode, we explored a subtle yet damaging aspect of leadership unconscious shaming and its impact on accountability. And today we're continuing this series and this conversation around blockers to workplace accountability by focusing on bullying behaviors used by leaders and sometimes others, it's not just leaders, uh, bullying behavior that's used and the impact it has on team morale and effectiveness. But before we continue, make sure that you have hit the subscribe button if you're catching us on our YouTube channel or if you're watching us here live in on LinkedIn, make sure that you uh, connect with us and follow us so that you can stay up to date on our latest leadership videos. And don't forget, we always really appreciate it when you give our videos a thumbs up if you find this information valuable or share it within your particular network. With that said, let's now explore those hidden blockers and to accountability by caused by unconscious, yes, it's unconscious, bullying. Thanks, Heather, for that great intro. And hi, everyone. You know, bullying and leadership, it used to be more the norm with that autocratic leadership style that felt it was okay just to command and dismiss and put people down. And now that we we have a more enlightened approach to leadership, meaning that we train our leaders, we've added emotional intelligence and other leadership training into the mix, we can see how unconscious our current day's form of bullying actually is. And it can take many forms like you talked about, Heather, from the overt action in your example, like this public humiliation, to more subtle ones like exclusion or overpowering. And these behaviors often stem from a leader's a, a desire to assert control to get things done or just simply to mask their insecurities, to make them appear to be a strong person, a strong leader. But the, un the consequences of this behavior, it's really profound. It impacts employees, organizational dynamics, and accountability, in addition to the things that, that you said earlier, Heather. And employees subjected to bullying endure emotional turmoil, including more stress, more anxiety, depression, of course, leading to absenteeism, a loss of productivity, <laughs> as well as other physical health issues. It really, really impedes accountability because when we go as human beings, when we go into these unconscious power dynamics, the more somebody pushes and humiliates us, 
the more we fight back with passive aggressive behaviors and not doing what this bully is wanting us to do. And, and so you can see how it really leads to an unconscious, inauthentic organization where people are just really struggling to survive. Yeah, the, you know, bullying is an interesting one because the, you know, we, we know that in most, if not all jurisdictions these days that we have anti-harassment, anti-bullying legislation that is in place. And so you would think that that would put an end to any sort of uh, use by leaders of this particular dysfunctional behavior. And, and that's why we talk about the fact that it's unconscious. And, and you know, I met, alluded to earlier that it's not just leaders that will use this behavior. And we see it in customers interacting with employees. We see it with suppliers interacting uh, with their client organizations and vice versa. I mean, this use of this behavior goes beyond leaders. But in our context, we're thinking about it as it relates to accountability. And unconscious bullying is is just one of those behaviors where we know for sure that it's unconscious because they it, it comes up because they don't know how to lead and so they end up resorting to their own ideas about how to make things happen and and i know you know even i've heard clients say these things like you know you got to bang on the desk and you know to to be able to get your point across and it's like so still it's like that an inability now to how do i influence how do i persuade how do i you know resolve the issue how do i lead people to the outcome that I'm trying to get to. And so they, they're relying on their technical skills and that gap around their leadership skills is present. And so they default to these. And so simply put, we end up with technically competent leaders who don't know how to lead people. They don't get the training that they need. And that absence of that proper training and leadership and communication just leaves them ill-equipped to handle conflicts and team management effectively. And so you get these sort of blow-ups. You get this bullying behavior. Um, and, and I think what you know, where where they use language that's inflammatory, right? And all of this is a misguided attempt on to get back in control of the situation. Yeah, I, I know both of us, Heather, have had that experience of talking to a client and listening to what a client has said to their employees and and really struggling to keep our reaction to them. And you said that. <laughs> But again, to your point of this being unconscious, they're, they're really leading with the strength of their personality. Um, and leaders can have personality traits or, or a personality type. The ESTJ, for example, is always that, that poster person for the autocratic leader um, when they don't have leadership training. They can also have psychological issues that predispose them to engage in what we consider are bullying behaviors. And they just think that it's actually being strong and being powerful and doing their job. But also traits like narcissistic defenses that we've talked a lot about, deep-seated insecurities or, or a compulsive need for control, it leads them to assert unhealthy dominance over their subordinates. They can't tolerate that we're in this together. It's I always have to be at the top of the hierarchy. And this behavior not only reflects their own vulnerabilities, but also their inadequacy um, in genuine leadership roles. They tend to focus more on self-promotion and asserting their importance and their power rather than on the success and welfare of their team. So as an example, a leader might constantly belittle team members' ideas in meetings to maintain a sense of their superiority, making it look like they know better. They have all the answers. And these are the leaders with this unconscious bullying that really create a hostile work environment where their self-protective persona it takes precedence over constructive team dynamics and collaboration. Yeah, and, and I think it's, you know, as we're talking about this but piece around bullying, I, I want to be really clear when we're looking at this is we're talking about sort of overt and covert forms of bullying. But there's been a little bit of a move, and I don't know if you've experienced, those of you in our audience have experienced this in your own organizations, where we, we hear employees accusing their leaders of bullying because the leaders are being really clear about expectations and they're correcting people when they're not working in compliance or following those expectations or if they're, 
you know, they consider them bullying if they're telling people how to do their job when they feel like when the employee feels like they shouldn't be involved and they should just leave me alone to do my job the way I want to do it. And so we want to be really clear in this because, you know, as we're talking about this, we, we're not looking at the behavior of leaders that actually is in support of accountability because Ann and I are 110% behind that. And that's yeah. what we work with our clients to shift their behavior into. What we're really looking at here is that, um, you know, bullying that really comes out and things like, you know, from an overt perspective, it's actions like yelling at an employee in anger, slamming doors, displaying aggressive body language, such as, you know, standing over a seated employee in a threatening manner manner it it you know it's I, I, and I have a client who does this always with a smile on his face but it's like that 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 way of sort of the language that comes out and and or something in their body language where you know reaching over and you know leaning in a little bit closer and you sort of you know how you feel in that moment and you start to feel threatened as a result of their behavior their reaction um I've even heard in, in one client where you know, they talked about, um, you, you know, it's really not bullying. It's the leader's just really passionate. And so it's just a passionate expression of how they're feeling in the moment. And I'm like, you know, it's like, so we have to look at those places where, you know, sometimes still today, as much as we've talked about bullying, I don't think we're always that clear about what it means and what it looks like and what it doesn't look like in the workplace. Um, you, you know, telling an employee to shut up in a public setting that's, you know, bullying or, or even during a one-to-one -on -one -on -one meeting is a blatant example. And the leaders often mistake bullying for authority, right? Not realizing how they've gone from exercising authority over and they've crossed the line into bullying and they just don't see how that demotivates or alienate team members. I mean, we still have clients where they believe that if they don't go into this type of behavior from time to time, they won't have the respect that they need, you know, in their roles or they won't get people to comply the way they need to comply. And again, this is, I've only got one tool in my toolbox. That's the tool I learned how to use and I'm going to keep using it. And it really is counter effective relative to driving for accountability. And certain, as Anne mentioned, certain personality types, ESTJ is a really good example. They have that need to be in control and they move to dominate versus lead. And they, again, not knowing that distinction. Dominating is pushes you into that bullying behavior. So they really do believe, and this is the, what they convince themselves of, that they believe that it's in the employee's best interest to be yelled at when they do something wrong to make sure that they don't do it again. And it actually has the opposite impact when you actually look at the, the end result of this type of behavior. And as you're talking about that, that just the, the mindset that some leaders have in that belief that that they have to either threaten or intimidate the employee to motivate them because they haven't found any other way of getting employees to do what they want them to do. And we often encounter this in our leadership training where we talk about consequences for for um, employees that aren't meeting timelines. And, and of course, a lot of leaders, their minds just go to that idea that, um, you know, we have to give that final solution or, or put them on notice that if they do it again, <laughs> they're gonna be fired. And that's a threat, that's not a consequence. And a, a threat is actually threatening the job loss, a threat of demotion or, or something that that um, is going to cause that employee to to wor be working in fear and feeling powerless to do anything about it, and so they're compelling compliance is, is actually what they're doing, and they might resort to this tactic due to as uh, either wanting absolute control or, as we said earlier, they just don't know how to handle opposition or criticism or even even when criticism is constructive and so they respond in this way to control and to shut things down and employees feel bullied and leaders might argue well this isn't actually bullying this is just shutting people down but anytime you take away someone's power through your own powering behavior it can be considered as bullying and so this type of behavior creates a culture of fear where employees are more focused on avoiding this final solution or avoiding the threats that are going to come than contributing pos positively. And like parents, you know, when leaders are like this, 
they they throw these threats around of of you're going to lose your job or you're not going to get the next project or what whatever it is and then they don't follow through on it so it's these threats are really actually quite um empty and just as a final word heather to your example of these intimidating types of behaviors i recall this was years and years ago where i was doing a an mbti debrief session with um with a vp that actually did not want to have anything to do with the leadership development process in the organization and i walked into his office and he said have a seat i sat down on the chair and my nose was actually at the level of the desk and his chair was up above and he even had the seats in his office positioned to intimidate anyone who came into his office and sat down it's it's amazing when you think of some of those tactics right they, that they can use and that you, you know again and how people it's so that's the kind of person where it's like you insist upon meeting in a, a neutral meeting space and not in their office right uh and i think you know that sort of ties in well to kind of the next piece is we you know i talked about the overt um bullying but when we get into the more covert or passive bullying behaviors these are often more challenging for us and employees to identify as actually being bullying and and you, you know i i know that ann and i spend a lot of time in our client environments naming behavior right because people are reacting the, to the behavior they're experiencing the behavior but they don't always know so, to sort of what what to look at it and how to define it in a way that allows us to then problem solve it or develop our way through it and and covert or passive aggressive bullying is definitely falls into that um that place where it's there and you know it's there but can't quite put your finger on it and then you have to second you know you sometimes you think oh was it really there or was it not there right now it can be everything from exclusion from important meetings oh i'm so sorry i didn't realize you were missed on that invite right um withholding critical information oh but i was so sure that you knew about this and i'd let you know right uh and or even going so far as to sabotage somebody else's work right and passive power can be achieved by spreading rumors it can be spreaded distortions i mean i, I have a couple of clients where you, you know you've got a few individuals that are constantly gossiping about other people with that intent and in fact in one of my client organizations we've got a leader who's a bully who, who does this so effectively where you know he goes in and you know all smiles and really pleasant you think you're telling me chit chat that's like you know that's so and so they're they're really not going to make it that well in this job don't you think and it's like this way of sort of pulling other people in through this really lovely covert uh, bullying, because that's basically what he is. He's bullying people into deciding, and then he can leave that room and say, oh, so-and-so totally agreed with me on my assessment of this, and you didn't even have to open your mouth because it's just yeah. they're pulling you in in that way. Another terrible form of bullying, of course, is gaslighting, um, where the bully causes others to doubt their perceptions of reality. And, you know, a leader might deny previous statements or decisions. We hear this all the time. Uh, gaslighting, confusion, and self-doubt. You know, a leader goes along in the moment and then comes back and says, oh, I never agreed to that. I never said that. I don't know what you're talking about. And you sort of think, oh, wow, is that like, did I really miss it by that much? Um, and I've even had that happen to me with one of my clients where, we had this great meeting, totally agreed. I, you know, I got the green light to go ahead. Um, and then we started to take action on that green light approval that we got. And people started to question it. And what are you doing? And why are you doing this? Totally backtracked. Because again, he wasn't confident to, to stand up and say, no, I made the decision. I want to do this. This is important. We need to do this. And it took us another two years before we were finally able to get that leader back to doing what he'd agreed to do the two years earlier and because of that fallout relative to that. But that really, that passive aggressive bullying really hangs people out there in a way that's um, that, again, causes that fear and uncertainty and lets them stay in that power position. Um, you know, the. Uh, um, the type, this type of bullying is particularly destructive, right? Because as I said earlier, it's difficult to prove. It's difficult. Sometimes we struggle even to name it. Like, is, is it real? And, and because it is unconscious, remember, these people are not doing it with that conscious intent. It's coming up in reaction to that fear of being out of control or that fear of, of conflict or whatever it might be that's triggering it. But the bottom line is it leaves the employees or anyone who's working with these individuals feeling really helpless and feeling really undermined, right? 
and I think what you're saying, Heather, it's, it's really at the core when we look at bullying overall that, that the behavior of one person is causing the other person to feel absolutely powerless or, you know, questioning in their own sense of reality. And, you know, there's another component of this that we haven't touched on, and it's a, a type of emotional bullying where um, somebody pr will present, a leader will present as long suffering or they're a martyr because they can't get their people to do um, what they want them to do and the employees end up feeling guilty. And, and yes, it does get people to a point to work harder, but the way those employees feel and the way others feel is that they don't want to be around this person and they don't want to be, as, as you said, Heather, the, they don't want to be that one that's being gossiped about because in, in essence, you cannot trust someone who's using these types of covert bullying behaviors. You can't trust them to be on your side and be there for you because hey, they'll focus on your mistakes. They'll talk about your mistakes. They'll take credit for your success. They'll, you know, come into a meeting and say, wait a second, that was my idea. I talked about that a year ago. And of course, the collective memory is such that people don't remember that. And they're just jumping in and taking credit for something that doesn't even belong to them. And this, this type, this can really demoralize employees in a the emotional bullying at a different level because fundamentally it, it destroys any sense of psychological safety or a feeling that you belong and you're safe in this group and that you can trust your leader to either have your back or to appreciate all of your hard work. And, you know, there are times even when, you know, some of our clients um, who, who approach um, who approach their leaders this way. And I, I was just um, thinking of, of one that I've been working with lately who leads the charge in discrediting or misrepresenting the way their boss talks, accusing, accusing their boss of being mean and cruel and hurtful when they simply have a directive type of communication, they're very efficient in their communication style, but because the boss isn't all warm and fuzzy and sending emojis, it means that they're being mean and they're bullying their workforce. And the more this person talks about it, the more the collective takes on this notion that their boss, that, that their boss is actually not to be trusted. And the team morale is affected. The whole culture is affected by this type of covert emotional acting out. Yeah, that just sort of reinforces what I was saying earlier, right? It's like it, we we often sort of see it and and recognize it from you know in the leaders, but but employees, our peers, you know, there there's so many places where this behavior can come out. And I was actually just talking to a client about this today, where you know one of their direct reports actually uses this behavior um, in interactions, both when their boss is there and when their boss is not there, um, in order to try and get in control and and get what they want and and it, it's you know sort of talking about you know how do you boundary that behavior without constantly having to go as the person's boss and saying you know that behavior was inappropriate that behavior was inappropriate and and it's a it's a tight line there we because it's you know sometimes with it is it, it they go right up to it and but not so far over it that you can say okay from a legal perspective we need to actually take action on this it's but it's it's in that zone that's ready like heading to red but it's where it's not productive for the team it's not productive for the organization and we have to manage the behavior around it and you know as i said a little bit earlier that sometimes employees will perceive overbearing supervision or micromanagement by their leaders as a form of bullying. And now it, when we really look at the true definition of micromanagement, of course, that's characterized by excessively controlling or closely monitoring an employee's work to an unreasonable extent. And a, yes, absolutely. That can be deeply demoralizing. And 
leaders though again this is this is an aspect of bullying leaders may engage in this tactic due to those fears around losing control a lack of trust in the team's competencies or even their own insecurities around their abilities right and so it's like they're trying to keep their hands on everything in and to the extent where they're over involved in it and this it can also stem from the leader's, you know, tendencies towards perfectionism, uh, reluctance to really delegate tasks and responsibilities. So my, such micromanagement, when we're, we're putting micromanagement, not because I need to micromanage you because you're new to the task, you're just learning, I want to make sure you've got it right before I move into a more hands-off management style, when we're talking about that obsessive micromanagement or that overly controlling approach to, to management, does lead to, to decreased job satisfaction and increased stress among team members. And, and so just thinking about that behavior along with this unconscious bullying, because that micromanaging is another form of staying in control. And people end up feeling scrutinized. They feel, um, you know, unable to make independent decisions. So in fact, bullying behavior fosters dependency, not independence. Um, and I know from my own experience, it, it just, you know, you so you end up sitting in that place of feeling like, and I, I like hear, heard this from a client recently, it's like you feel like you can't get anything right. And that, you, you know, and that's what they they sort of fixate on. And that that's where they, the energy of this leader tends to go into is that focus on, on what's going wrong. It, and it, it puts me in mind of, of someone you and I worked with years and years ago, where the persona of this client, Heather, she was just so sweet and and presented herself as wanting the best for everyone but she was an absolute tyrant behind the scenes and you know really only interested in her agenda and squeezing every little bit of work that she could get out of her people with unrealistic expectations for them and and essentially what she did was she created such a a, a culture of fear and intimidation the people kept leaving. <laughs> She'd bring people on and they'd be attracted to this sweet woman who really wanted the best for the world and the world's health and, you know, you know to creating products that were in everyone's best interest. And in the meantime, behind the scenes, when you worked for her, as you said, Heather, you'd be walking on eggshells, not knowing when you were going to be blindsided or poked or somebody telling you that isn't good enough because that that's sort of the 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 language of the bullying leader is let me find you doing something wrong so that i can let you know that so that i can raise my currency because i know how to do it right and these unconscious power dynamics that are going on they really destroy accountability because first of all, who wants to work for someone like that? As lovely as, you know, a boss can be at times, you're always, always waiting for that other shoe to drop and accountability suffers with individuals less likely to step forward, innovate anything, put anything forward that might invite some dressing down by their boss. Yeah, and I, you know, I we we've watched the the fallout of this in organizations. And again, I, you know, certainly things we keep evolving, we keep developing as a society and in organizational life to to where we would like to see that bullying behavior completely goes away. But but it's still there, and it it, it it's still an aspect that we we need to be able to to speak to. But you know, we've watched so many incredibly talented individuals that we've worked with really lose their confidence as a result of that prolonged exposure to this sort of unconscious bullying behavior. And because again, in that situation, they're not necessarily aware, they're not thinking of, oh, you know, there the leader goes again, that's just bullying, that's about them, that's not about me, I can stay separate and and, and protect myself, they end up, their confidence falls. And the, the longer they're exposed to it, the less likely they are to actually leave because they start to believe that, you know, that the boss has all the currency and they don't have any and that they're just lucky to be where they are and nobody could possibly, you know, want them or they couldn't possibly have anything to bring to the rest of the world and they're just lucky they're 
they're in the place that they're in when really it's the boss who's lucky because they're the one that has this person working like crazy in support of their uh, ambition and their objectives. So, so there's long-term implications for individuals within that context, uh, certainly the overall health and success of the organization. You know, as Anne has mentioned, you know, bullying, sustained bullying inside of an organization, even if it's on, you know, sort of not all overt that that subtle bullying leads to a culture of fear which we need, know shuts down innovation it fosters dependencies so employees are less likely to work autonomously um it it keeps the company small at the core right because we're all playing into that or working around the fear of that individual leader um, it's always the best people that end up leaving early on, the ones that have the most self-esteem and, and they just think, I'm not putting up with this, I'm out of here, um, don't need this kind of environment. And, and that kind of turnover too, it disrupts the workflow, the continuity, but there's a lot of strain that goes on into the resources when you're constantly bringing new people in. You know, as Anne's example talked about where the turnover in this one particular organization was massive and the company had a ton of potential, but as long as that leader was, was leading it, it wasn't going anywhere because it was stuck in this constant constant churn. Um, the reputation of the organization can, can definitely suffer. Um, you see it especially in those places where um, there's a lot more expectation being placed on how you interact with your suppliers and your community uh, really does matter. Um, and so that will continue to be a factor. And you know, in the long run, and we, you know, we can't say this enough ways, it's like that the workplace that's tainted by bullying and the consequent erosion of accountability just faces serious challenges in sustaining performance, innovation and competitiveness in the marketplace. And so that's why it's so important to, to really reflect on and consider for those of you that are in our audience here, to, to really think about where you're seeing this behavior. And, and again, both the overt and the covert aspects of bullying and starting to be able to recognize and name it because that's the for always the first step in us being able to work to develop our way through it, right? And when, one of the challenges that leaders face is, is that the, the, there is a way that leaders will get stuck because employees get frightened to do anything or say anything even should a leader be open to getting feedback that their behavior is causing issues, employees are too afraid and because it, bullying, it, it elicits a fight flight reaction in us and we react from our emotions to bullying. And our reaction from our emotions causes us to either get angry or get afraid of this person because we believe they shouldn't be behaving like this. And here's the reality, they do. You think of how little training there is in even performance management, let alone, you know, training them for the complex interpersonal dynamics they face as leaders. And without any training in communication, empathy, conflict resolution, you know, other awareness, employee awareness and awareness of the impact of our behavior on others, they unconsciously use what comes natural to them. And then with their direct reports and other leaders angry at them, there's no empathy toward this leader. There is no thinking, how do I manage up? How do I help this person? This person is going to tank their career or keep losing good people if they keep behaving in this way. And, and so in essence, it's a really self-destructive solo pattern that leaders can get into because in fact, they're alienating people and causing them to go into an emotional response that stops them from even helping them um, a, get some get the needed feedback to change their behaviors yeah i think i that makes me think of a, one of our clients where you know we've been in working with them for a while and um uh, we'd been coaching some of the folks that work for this individual who had a tendency to pull out these uh, unconscious bullying behaviors uh, when he was feeling out of control. And in one of their converse, in one of their interactions, uh, our client said to him, you can't like you can't talk to me like this. Let's look at more productive ways to have this conversation. And by drawing that line, interestingly, that that it, it that 
that use of bullying behavior got taken away from that leader. It didn't stop him from doing it with other individuals, but you saw that shift in that behavior there because in that moment got called out on it. And and, it, and you have to recognize, as Anne was saying, and, and we, we often don't think about the leader, right? Because we're so busy reacting to that behavior, but they're not adequately trained like that this is the gap they're dealing with a skill gap they're doing the best they can to try and get the way and i'm not excusing bullying behavior but if we don't look at it objectively and look at what's behind the behavior we then make it in we come to the conclusion that they just need to be fired or this is an unchangeable situation and there's nothing i can do about it we feel powerless and all the power rests with them and we want to change that dynamic here so if we've got leaders feeling insecure about their ability to lead or their ability to navigate some of these changing situations situations and environments, you start to look at what are the triggers for this leader that leads to the bullying behavior um, and, and where that in insecurity is manifesting as that need to exert control over every aspect of what's going on. And in the absence of more constructive, constructive leadership strategies, these leaders are resorting to these other behaviors that actually get in the way of accountability. So we want to be able to work with them in order to make that shift. But when we haven't invested in the development of our leaders, if we haven't looked at us as a collective, if you're part of a leadership team and you've got someone on your team that's behaving like this, then then these are the kinds of things that we're always going to experience. You know, the micromanagement, the more aggressive communication. Can't tell you the number of clients we've worked with who say they they resolve issues by whoever has the loudest voice in the room at the end of the conversation. Uh, intimidation to maintain that semblance of control, right? So that over reliance on force and authority. If you're experiencing that in your organization, or maybe if you're using that yourself it's just starting to understand and connect that to what is actually going on because as we always say there is a way through development in order to break this habit of relying on unconscious bullying uh, to be able to stay in control in these situations yeah and, and in addition to the consequence of uh, a lack of accountability in organizations the other one is is just normalizing bullying. And we've had clients that have talked to us about this where, you know, they're regularly sworn at because that's what everybody does or they're regularly left out of meetings because they aren't quote unquote liked by the person organizing the meeting. And this is normalized. And once it becomes normalized, it's very difficult to, ch to change this this habit that's set by leaders and of course anytime new leaders come on board they look to model the behavior of the senior leadership and so they just you know keep it going and keep things rolling and leaders who rely on this type of force and intimidation to get things done as we talked about they don't recognize it they think they're being strong they're firm they're decisive because they don't have that insight into the impact of their behavior on other people. And we can't say it enough. Leaders need, need to build emotional intelligence. It's one of the, the first pillars of leadership development because without, this, uh, without awareness of the impact of their behavior, normalization of aggressive leadership, you know, just perpetuates a cycle where they're accepted and ex these behaviors are accepted and expected by people, you know, that, you know, I don't care if so-and-so yells at me. Yeah, it's normal. He's always like that. He always does that. And again, thinking about the impacts that we've talked about, lack of communication as employees feel that there's going to be a negative consequence if they don't stay in the shadows, hiding out, hoping that nobody is going to see them and criticize them. Yeah. It's, so it's that time, right? It's that time to move on and let's, let's strike bullying, unconscious bullying from uh, uh, our organizational environments. And we want it, we to walk away from this session. I, you know, we've given you lots of information about it, about what to look for, what it looks like, how it shows up. And, and it is very common. I, in, in a, again, I know in today's context, some of the more aggressive aspects of bullying and overt, you know, we, we have the legal lines, but there's a lot of work that can still be done in your organizational environment and that by eliminating that bullying or making those moves towards eliminating this this practice or habit of using unconscious bullying you start to lift from an accountability perspective you start to be able to move your organization and your team forward 
in terms of increasing their orientation towards and that culture of accountability that we're all striving for. And the way we go about it is we have to address uh, bullying in a more holistic fashion. We have to look at it through that lens of a cultural dysfunction as opposed to being about the person. And, and we hear this all the time where, you know, someone will say, well, just fire them and then it, it fixes the problem. Well, it really doesn't because as Anne was saying, it, it gets normalized, it gets sort of in, in there. And, and so that there, it becomes a pattern of behavior that is accepted in the organization. And it's never in our experience anyway, it's never just one individual that is utilizing this particular unconscious strategy or defensive strategy, right? So it's about prioritizing leadership development. Absolutely, as Anne said, emotional intelligence, we can't say it enough. Self-awareness, self-management, impulse control, you know, impact on others. These are all things that we want. But other awareness, the we all, all things and empathy, like, you, you know, the list goes on and on and what we need to develop in order for us to be able to move out of this pattern of behavior um, and really looking at those those kinds of approaches that are also thinking about, you know, communication, empathetic management techniques, uh, but also, you know, where a lot of it gets triggered up is like, you know, in those situations of really understanding their mindset and what gets triggered from that perspective of what's more likely to make them push them to feel out of control that will cause them to use this particular strategy. Uh, what are some of the ways in which they can have other techniques and other tech tools from a leadership perspective that will allow them to feel in control without going to this particular approach of bullying, right? They also have to be held accountable for their behavior. And that is one of obviously the biggest challenges in organizations, especially Especially if the bullying behavior starts at the CEO level, there is typically in these environments where we go in, there isn't that orientation towards accountability and people are not being held accountable for their behavior. And oftentimes behaviors, all behaviors are acceptable. And, and even if we talk about unacceptable behavior, if someone demonstrates it, nobody then goes in and says, hey, that wasn't okay and put the boundaries around it. So that's another place to focus from that defining those expectations around behavior and really working to hold people accountable to those expectations. Uh, organizational support, uh, helping people to develop their leadership style, as I said, but really looking, thinking about you, the development of well-rounded leaders and also the systems and practices that support those leaders to be effective and to not shift into using uh, these defensive strategies for a bullying, uh, unconscious bullying, because that's what we're trying to do. We want to get them, the leaders, and get the organization collectively, and where we start saying that's not acceptable, and that's not acceptable, and no, that's not acceptable, what's the alternative then? Because we can't just stay stop doing this, it's stop doing this, and let us support you to do something instead, because they need that other strategy, they need those other tools, if they're really going to make a sustained change out of this unconscious bullying behavior. So important to look at this systemically, isn't it? So that's a wrap for this episode of Dismantling Dysfunction. As always, we're your hosts, Heather Drenitzeris and myself, Dr. Ann Drenitzeris. Thank you so much for listening and join us again for our next exciting episode where we explore the hidden blockers to accountability caused by leaders who disappear. Love this <laughs> very, I love this one. Very different than our... <laughs> the wall. Right. We also call this the avoidant, passive, unavailable leadership approach used by leaders who don't know how to deal with conflict or manage misaligned performance or hold employees accountable. And remember, if you're feeling challenged by the leadership or accountability gaps in your organization and want to know more about what you can do about it, call us, give us a call, send us an email, and, or attend one of our free webinars on why leaders avoid fostering accountability. Our webinars offer insight into the five key mistakes, and there's lots more, but these are the five key when it comes to creating a culture of accountability and the exact blueprint you can use to foster accountability in your organization. And I echo Anne's comments. Thank you so much for investing your time and either catching us uh, live on LinkedIn or catching the replay there on YouTube. We really appreciate you being part of our audience to gain insights into the competencies leaders need to master all things accountability in your organization. Don't forget, we've got tons of great content both on LinkedIn and uh, through our podcast or on our YouTube channel, Dranit Saris 
hyphen Hilliard. And remember to subscribe to our channel, turn on your notifications, follow us on LinkedIn, uh, and give us reviews, give us feedback. We'd love to hear from you. As Anne said, if you found this information valuable, we really appreciate you sharing the word with others who could also benefit. Um, thanks again for joining us. And until next time, we look forward to having you back in our audience real soon. Thank you for listening to the Dismantling Dysfunction podcast with Dr. Andra Anitsaris and Heather Dranitsaris Hilliard, organizational development and behavioral change experts. Be sure to subscribe to get more practical insights and focused tools to help you dismantle dysfunction in your organizations, leaders, or relationships. For more information, visit dismantlingdysfunction.com.